Hey everyone, it's Will here from Single Track Magazine and SingleTrackWorld.com and I'm currently in the Wombat State Forest and I'm about to take you guys for a ride on this test bike right here. Now if this is your first time joining us on YouTube, consider hitting that subscribe button just down there because we have plenty more videos coming for you in the near future. Right, so the bike that I am riding today, it's a test bike and it's from Merida. This is the 2019 Merida 120 8000. Now it's a 29er trail bike, it's not a cross country race bike or an enduro bike, it's sort of somewhere in between. So we have 130 millimeter travel RockShox pike on the front, 120 millimeters of travel out back. This is a RockShox Deluxe Shock on the back of this bike. It's a full carbon fiber frame, so fairly lightweight. I believe it's sub three kilos with the rear shock. Carbon fiber mainframe, carbon fiber swing arm. We've got a SRAM X01 drivetrain here, 12 speed with uh, carbon fiber cranks too. We have a 150 millimeter dropper post from KS, which is quite nice. Also up here, we have SRAM code RSC disc brakes. Very, very powerful uh, downhill oriented brakes, but uh, Merida specking them on a trail bike, which is interesting. The wheels we've got on here are from FSA. These are not a common wheel set. It's the Gradient Wide R, and these have a 29 millimeter internal rim width, carbon fiber rim. Very nice, very buzzy free hub mechanism. The other thing I'm going to be testing is a different set of tyres. Normally this bike comes with a set of Maxxis tyres. Today I'm running some specialised tyres. These are a bit lighter. We've got a ground control on the front. It's 2.3 inches wide with the grid casing. We've got a fast track on the back. That's 2.3 inches wide as well, also with the grid casing. Dropped around 170 grams from the Maxxis tyre combo, but the tread profile is a lot faster rolling. So I'm interested to see how this bike goes on some faster, flowier trails with some lighter and faster rolling tyres. So without further ado, I'm going to jump on the bike and hit the trail. I'm going to take you guys on board with the 2019 Merida 120. All right, here we go. So we're on the Wombat Loop out at the Wombat State Forest. This is just outside of a town called Woodend. And Woodend is pretty much smack bang in the middle between Melbourne and Bendigo. So it's probably, whoop. So it's probably about an hour's drive from each one to get here. So while we're meandering along this starting section of trail, talk a little bit about this bike. This is, whoop, trees there. Whew. So this is the Merida 120, and it's all new for 2019. Merida have had this model in their lineup for a good few years now. It's progressively gotten more burly as time has gone on. So this current version, oh, tight, gap there coming down here nice and rocky and loose been very dry here so it's quite dusty Woo. yeah some tight corners through here so it's a great test for handling of the bike and although bikes are kind of getting slacker and longer and lower and really great for flat out descents. Old school trails like this tend to highlight the shortcomings of that kind of geometry style. So this is also part of the reason I wanted to bring this Merida here because the geometry in general on this bike kind of strikes a bit of a balance, at least on paper anyway. Merida's kind of modernized the geometry a little bit over the previous 120, but they haven't gone too far. So the head angle on this model with the 130 millimeter travel fork is kicked back to 67.3 degrees and the seat tube angle or effective seat tube angle is 75.5, which is quite steep. They've lengthened the reach measurement a little bit. I'm on the medium here and reach is 435, which I wouldn't say is particularly long these days. They certainly could have gone longer, but whether or not they needed to is a different question. Whew. Oh yeah. Here we go, some nice tight twisty corners here and getting surprisingly good hookup from these specialized tires, which have struggled a bit on my local trails, which are very rocky and very loose and sandy. The soil here is much loamier. You can tell the, the immediate environment, although it hasn't rained here for quite some time, it's a lot greener. But we've got a little drop coming up here. 
Here we go. Woo. <laughs> Drifting the back end through there just to avoid hitting that tree. And uh, this bike is uh, picking up speed well through here. Certainly not having any issues with the handling on those tight corners. This bike feels quite agile and poppy, which up until this point in time, and I've been riding this for a few weeks now, that would kind of be my summation of its riding qualities. Quite stiff through the back end, and I mean that in terms of lateral stiffness through the back end. Merida have used, as they do on all their full suspension bikes, a single pivot suspension system. So you don't have a pivot in between the rear axle and the main pivot. And it kind of has that single pivot characteristic where it really snaps and pops out of the corners, which I think is exacerbated by that stiff back end. So it's very responsive. Handling's nice and sharp. Speaking of, Merida has shortened chain stays on this bike. It's now 435 millimeters, which I think is a good balance. That shorter length does help the bike carve around tight corners more easily. Comparing it to other test bikes I've been riding lately, I feel like it's got better efficiency than the Giant Trance. I would say on par with the Canyon Neuron CF, but crucially, there is better sensitivity with this Merida. And you can feel that with this big stroke air shock that they've got on the back of this. The RockShox Deluxe Shock has a 55 millimeter stroke. So you get 120 mil of travel out of that 55 millimeter stroke. It's nearly a two to one leverage ratio, so it's very low. The other interesting aspect about the suspension design on this 120 is what Merida calls float link. This is the design we've seen on their other full suspension bikes like the 160, the 140, and also the E160 as well. Float link basically refers to the placement of the rear shock. Now from the side, it sort of looks like a normal kind of four bar arrangement. The rear shock doesn't actually mount to the main frame. Instead, it floats inside the swing arm where it's compressed by the rocker link at the top and an extension of the chainstay tube. Now, as you go through the travel, that lower pivot actually rotates away from the shock ever so slightly. And the idea there, a little bit more of a bottomless feeling to the end of the travel. I can say in practice, it really works. I've run this bike with various sag settings on the rear shock, I've been experimenting with that lately. But regardless of sag, I'm finding it's, I'm using all the travel on this bike, but even when I do use full travel, you don't really know about it. There's no harsh bottom out slam as the rear shock compresses all the way. It's really smooth, really gradual. This is a design we've seen from other brands like Trek. They obviously use a similar design on their Fuel EX and Top Fuel platforms. And there are other brands out there as well that are using floating shock designs. So Merida isn't unique in that regard, but certainly, whoop, but certainly they've employed it to good effect on this bike. Now I mentioned SAG before, it's something I've been experimenting with lately on the rear suspension and the fork as well. Initially, under the guidance of Merida, I set up the rear shock at 30% SAG. Now, before I mentioned about that big air can on here and the 55 millimeter stroke. So to get 30% SAG, I only had 110 PSI inside the shock, which is not very much at all. That's very low pressure. And I was finding, definitely using travel fairly regularly. So I've decided to reduce the sag a little bit, increase the air pressure, not by much. I went up to 120 PSI, which is only 10 PSI more. But remember, because it's a low pressure system, that's actually quite a large percentage. So bump that up to 120 PSI, and that's brought the sag down to 25%. And the feeling I've got now is 
Woo, yeah. Although it's slightly firmer. Whoa, almost collected the trees there. Although it's slightly firmer, finding it's giving it just a little bit more pop, a little bit more sprightliness. Overall, I think I prefer it at that lower sag amount at that 25%. And uh, conversely, I've been messing around with the fork as well. So this RockShox Pike, it's the higher end RCT3 model. So it's got the Charger 2 damper in there, adjustable low speed compression, three position lockout with the open pedal and firm settings. Interestingly though, I mean, the Pike is a great fork. It's something that I've ridden many variations of this fork over the years. But for some reason in this shorter travel application, 130 mil, it just doesn't feel as plush as the back end. Certainly compared to the Fox 34s that I've been using on the white S120, on the Canyon Neuron CF, and the Giant Trance 29, this Pike just doesn't feel as supple. It just feels a little, like there's a little bit more stiction there. Not quite as smooth as I was expecting. I ended up opening the fork and I found three bottomless tokens inside from stock. So over the course of a few rides, I pulled the token out, changed the air pressure, ridden the fork, played around with settings, rebound damping and so on. Then the next ride, I've taken out another token, done the same thing. And I've gotten to the point where I've got no tokens inside this fork at all. And what that's allowed me to do is run slightly higher pressure, which reduces the sag, keeps the fork, ooh, keeps the fork riding higher in its travel to begin with. But once it gets moving, gives it better activity throughout the travel all the way to the end. So with zero tokens inside, it's definitely more linear. For me, I found it to feel a lot better. Now I've taken all those bottomless tokens out. As for setup on the rest of the bike, I've been pretty happy with how this bike comes out of the box. I really like the brakes. These are SRAM Code RFCs. Really snappy feel of the lever. Much more solid feeling than comparable SRAM Guide or level brakes. They're a pretty big brake to put on a trail bike, but hats off to Merida for making that spec choice because they're a fantastic addition on this bike. The wheels so far have been solid. Nice and buzzy free hub mechanism that you can probably hear there on the microphone. The stock tyres are good. I love that Maxxis Minion DHR2. But to be fair, this combo at the moment, the ground control on the front and the fast track on the back, really digging these on these loamier, smoother trails here. Definitely adding a bit more speed to this bike. As for the cockpit, KS dropper post, of course, no problems there at all. Really like this southpaw lever here, which just puts the paddle right where your thumb is. Very, very nice shape, smooth, ergonomic, comfortable. I'm into it. I also really like these grips. These are Merida's own brand grips, and normally I tend to find the house brand grips pretty cheap and nasty, but these are really, really good. The bar width, something I would normally complain about. These are 760 millimeters wide. On aggressive trail bikes, finding more and more riders are running 780s or even 800s. But I think on this bike, it works. And to be fair, today, on this sort of old school tight cross country single track, where the trees are getting very, very close, I'm really appreciating that 760 millimeter width. Plenty of occasions where a wider bar would have uh, sent me off the bike, that's for sure. Okay, coming towards the end of this Wombat Loop. Going to meander through the trees here. And I'm going to climb up onto a ridge line, drop down some steeper, faster, rougher descents down into the gully. And then we'll have one final climb back up to the car park. And so far, I think this is one of the best bikes that I've brought here. This 120 is making short work of all these tight, twisty corners, but it's got that solid trail bike feel where you need it. Big, powerful brakes, wide carbon rims, stiff back end. Gives it a really 
steady kind of feel when the speeds start to increase. And we've got a nice little log drop here. Woo! Into another rock drop. Whoa, sling the back end out there. Just got to remember I've got a very lightweight cross country tire on the back of this bike. And some of this is a little bit loose and chopped up. I had a race here over the weekend. Woo! So some of the trails are pretty dusty on these corners, lots of braking bumps. Here we are dropping down into the gully. Oh yeah! This bike just pops so well over that stuff. It's got great character, great pizzazz. Really wants to leap and bounce all over the place. Woohoo! the rock drop there and got one final descent back down down to the left Ooh, blown out there yes oh flowing beautifully along there now we're gonna head up left and back up out of the gully which means we're going to climb up this thing. Oh. Oh. That is quite steep. Now we've got the final climb up the edge of this hillside here. There we go, ride finished. I really enjoyed that and I hope you guys enjoyed watching. Uh, if you've got any questions for me about this test bike, this is the Merida 120, uh, drop them into the comment section below. If you enjoyed the video, give us a thumbs up and if you haven't already, consider hitting that subscribe button because I've got plenty more videos coming for you, including the full review on this bike. Got a little bit more testing I want to do with it. So far, pretty happy with it. You can see here, full travel on the rear shock, which is good. And on the fork, basically hit full travel there as well. So pretty happy with those suspension settings. There are a couple of drops there where I would have expected to use full travel. So, so far, uh, really enjoying this trail bike. Right, time for me to finish up, pack up, go get some lunch and a beer, I reckon. Hope you guys enjoyed and I'll see you guys next time. Tooroo.